Morning. Hello, everybody. For visitors and guests, my name is Teresa Russell, president of the Delaware Burlington Rotary Club, and I'd like to welcome you to the 22nd meeting of the 49th year of our club. And the pledge and invocation is Mr. Hans. As you prepare yourself for prayer to your God, Assume an attitude of joyfulness and thanksgiving. In this season, while we're giving gifts to others, let us remember those that are suffering, homeless, hungry, and feel helpless. Let us individually and as a group be the help that is needed. Be with each of us to display acts of kindness, to be of help to others. We thank you for the gifts you have given us and allow us to share those gifts with others in need. To these and the prayers on the hearts and minds of those assembled, we all say, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And Jim Farmer, would you like to introduce any guests? Do we have guests? We have none other than our speaker. Okay, we'll hold off on that for just a minute then. Anybody with announcements? In farmer. <laughs> Just want to remind everybody that uh, February 3rd is right around the corner. So uh, it's not too early to start thinking about Super Bowl and sponsors and teams. And I know that's first and foremost on everybody's mind that we before Christmas, but nevertheless, keep thinking. <laughs> Thank you. And no other announcements? I think we're ready for Connie's show. Connie's our sergeant today. Money out. Be payer. What? Would you carry the pot <laughs> and put a dollar in it? <laughs> there you go. I'll try the pot. What a food. Okay. Um. Everybody knows that we get to go find the mystery Rotarian today, right? So I encourage you as you're setting with your fellow Rotarians, ask some questions and maybe you'll get some of these right. This this one's a toughie, so uh, you gotta put your thinking hat on. But uh, do do I have Dave King? I was gonna call on you at or Dave King, Dave Hansen. I was going to ask you to help me because I have I'm not good at Spanish and there's a couple of words I don't understand. But, <laughs> so who who here could help me? Who Spanish speaking? Okay, I'm sure you'll know it. I'm sure you get up here. Um, I asked this person um, the same questions and um, boy, you talk about detail. Uh, we're going to do this, and then we'll do happy dollars. We're going to go a little bit in reverse today, okay? Get this one out of the way. Um, this person I asked, what, what was their first job? This was a tuggy. This person was a caddy. Who could that be? Who could that be in here? And again, if you guess and you're wrong, you're a dollar, but if you don't guess, you're going to get a dollar anyway, so you better try to guess. And the person that gets it is launched on me. Yes. Are they in this room? I'm going to tell you. Yeah, I'm going to guess Dave Hansen just to get it out of the way. Well, we put another dollar in. No, but Dave Hansen. Um, this person I asked this question to, and their answer was so lengthy, it was unbelievable. 
I asked what was the riskiest thing you ever did. And that's usually the one in a kind of different way. But this one was, um, it was a, a career decision that they made. Who could have me? Teresa. And Terry. Yep. Right on, right? Everybody has to get their dollar put in. Not, not, not. And this, I'm going to need you to sit for this first. Yeah, I need for you to, I, because I'm, I'm not a Spanish speaking person, and uh, there's a word in here that I'm just not sure of. That this person, uh, the question, the third question was, um, what was the most, most trouble that you ever got into? And this person said, me and a buddy were presenting a magic show in Metro Area High School's Spanish classes event. We were supposed to present in Spanish, but I couldn't remember any Spanish. Teacher later referred to us as those <laughs> idiotes. Those idiotes. Look at this face. Come on, guys. No, nobody. The throw it out. These were the answers I, I received, okay? I didn't have a whole lot to work with. <laughs> the last thing I ask, and this is the, the question that I love asking most, is uh, what, when did you know that you were a true Rotarian? And this first person wrote, they enjoyed their first meeting with so many members with shared interests and a common thread of humor. Now you can tell this is a real mouthy person, can't you? All these lengthy answers. Jerry. Who? Jerry. Put it out there, George, and everybody else. I just know, and I told this person I when I received his answers, if if you know who it is, it's the way he delivers to the point. Nobody knows no more. Yes. Al Wood. No. You know, that's a good one, but no. No, just throw dollars and just keep throwing. I hate to just tell you. Oh, oh yes. Tom Davis. No. Okay. Well, the true. Mystery Rotarian, please stand. Roger? Can you not hear him give his very lengthy answers to me? But anyway, so everybody, if you didn't put a dollar in, make sure you get one in. Now I'm going to ask for half a dollar. Half a dollar? Come on. Be happy. Nary a one. Happy to see the sun. Oh gosh, yes. Happy to see the sun. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. I'm so happy my kids are home from college. Awesome. That is good. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Lisa. Do we have any birthdays, anniversaries? Well, I have a uh, no birthdays, no anniversaries. Yes, Jerry. I'm putting in a dollar. Uh, uh, Monday, we drove over to uh, Ogilvy Park and drove through, uh, oh, I don't know, eight Christmas. miles of Christmas lights. And uh, uh, we had a good time, or at least my wife said we did. We're in the time of that. All the soon 29,000 people that attended and set for three hours. Oh, merge equipment? Oh my gosh. I read about that. I thought that was horrendous. Uh, one other thought. Do you know what today is? Anybody know what today is? Happened 120 years ago today. Jerry Cashman's work. I remember the birthday. <laughs> Nobody knows? It was.
was either the founding of Ohio or the founding of Wilmington because they were both 1803. Now that was too much. Well, your math is awesome. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's a hundred years of friend? <laughs> See, sort of stay the year. No, no, it was an event. Yes, the uh, the Wright Brothers flight, which I thought was yes. 20 years ago, several days ago. Yeah. Was it several days ago? Uh, no. 17. I'm sorry, it was December 17. I am so sorry, oh, but yes, and does anybody remember how high it came? Yeah. Fifteen feet. Uh, Fifteen feet. One hundred and twenty feet. Yes. Thanks, Dick, for the information. Any any other contributions that would like to be made? Well, Merry Christmas to all of you, and have a wonderful New Year. And hopefully, we'll see you next time. I remember the piece of art. That was All right, thank you very much, Tony. We always enjoy getting to know our fellow Rotarians, and I'll have Christy introduce our speakers. Hello. Um, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Will Moore. He is the founder and president of Veterans First Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, Dr. Will, uh, in 2017, he recognized the growing number of veterans in need of psychological support and began offering free psychotherapy to those veterans that were suffering due to their service to our great nation. Um, Dr. Will specializes in treatment for suicide, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, depression, anxiety, bereavement, addiction, and assist soldiers with their transition to civilian life. In 2007, he was the recipient of the U.S. Medal of Honor, presented for exceptional work within the medical community. Um, and uh, he has over 23 years of clinical experience in research. Veterans First Initiative is currently providing over 140 veterans with free therapeutic intervention, sessions, and management every month. Um, a fun fact that I hope he'll expound on is uh, he was also a national champion athlete in powerlifting. Please welcome Dr. Will Moore. First off, I cannot lift weights like that any longer. I was very young. Um, it was a great time of my life, like everybody has uh, in sports and athletics. You, you build that camaraderie. You learn so much about yourself, what you're able to do, things that you think you can't do, you can accomplish. And I think that kind of set the basis for my career. Um, I've been in the medical field for 23 years. I used to manage critical care patients with traumatic brain injuries at Ohio State. About 72% of my patients did not survive their injuries. So then I came in to come into play. I managed these patients for the possibility of organ donation. Uh, in the United States, I had the highest percentage of organ donors of any other doctor in America in 2007 and won a U.S. Medal of Honor for that from the president's office. Wow. Thank you. To me, it was about getting to know these people because you're working with the families, you're not working with the patient at this point. And it's helping them understand that out of something so tragic that happened today, something so positive and loving and caring can happen out of it. So I was very fortunate to see both sides of it. I've seen the folks that didn't survive, and I've seen people walk into the hospital with a suitcase knowing they're gonna get a life-saving organ. It was extremely rewarding. From that point on, I kind of decided that I want to do something to give back. I want to do something that truly makes an impact. So in 2017, I had a good friend of mine reach out to me who had a neighbor that was a Vietnam veteran. Is this working? Uh, batteries are dying. Oh, okay. We're going to change the batteries, perhaps. <laughs> Is that 
that for me. Thanks, Jerry, for <laughs> supplying the batteries. Yeah. So the arrow moves it forward, right? Yes. Okay. We need that like hold music for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Maybe you guys want to sing it <laughs> together. <laughs> Look at that. There we go. Now we're in business. So in 2017, a good friend of mine had reached out to me, a good neighbor who was a Vietnam veteran. And every morning they used to get up and have coffee together. And the veteran had unfortunately lost his wife to cancer and just slowly started staying in his house. He didn't come out anymore. So I met him up early one morning to have coffee. And the guy was really struggling. When he lost his wife, he lost the support system. He lost the person that knew who he was. No one else knew who he was. They were new to the community. They'd only lived there about a year. So... He agreed to talk to me if I'd meet him at 6.30 on Tuesday mornings, and 6.30 is not in my calendar. My day doesn't start that early. So I said, you put on the coffee, I'll be there. And for about a year straight, I met this gentleman every morning on his patio, having coffee, talking about his life, talking about the things that's happened to him in war, talking about the things that he can't change, and talking about the things he can change for the future. And I watched this guy from a year go from kind of wanting to talk to me, to really looking forward to those talks. So out of that, about six months later, I was invited to a veteran fair. Quite frankly, they didn't have enough vendors set up. So I was asked if I would mind putting up a booth for therapy at the fair. So I went to it. It was sponsored by the YMCA. And now looking back, that was patient two, three, and four. This slowly grew. And within about a year, I had 30 patients a month that I was treating for free. I was neglecting my dream practice that I had built for many years. And so some friends of mine invited me over to sit down and talk and basically said, you need to start a nonprofit. You need to do this so companies can support you and recognize it so you can do more work. So that's how this whole thing launched. So in 2018, we actually started a nonprofit. Nonprofit actually started in Crystal River, Florida, if you know where that where that's at. It's about an hour north of Tampa, Clearwater area. So some statistics that are just absolutely horrible. Does anybody know how many veterans die every year by suicide in the United States? Too many. Way too many. Over 14,000 a year. 39 a day are taking their own lives. My patient base is from 23 years old to 83 years old from Vietnam veterans all the way down to Afghanistan and everything in between. The foundation of what we're doing is understanding what these folks have been involved in. War is an ugly thing. It's nasty. Positive things aren't happening there in the sense of our psychological perspectives. They're seeing things that they never expected in their lives. Primary concerns that we have Suicide and PTSD, the suicide rate is astronomical and it is just continuing to grow. Um, even this morning here, I was asked about the VA, how the VA handles this. Um, I really don't work with the VA at all. Um, we think of our organization as an extension for folks that either can't get to a VA because they're not local to them or they go to the VA for certain things and come to me for mental health treatments. And the reason I do this, I, I, I don't have any issues with the VA. They are grossly underfunded, understaffed, and just overwhelmed with patients. For me, it's a, it's a lot different. Um, ever since COVID, the best thing for me is they now allow us to do telehealth medicine anywhere in the continental US. So I literally have patients from Florida to New York to California now. And many of those patients I used to see in my practice, but living in Florida, when I was going back and forth from Florida to here, a lot of those patients, obviously in the summertime, you know, go back north again. Well, it's allowed me to keep those patients on, on record and keep treating them. The PTSD is something that, it doesn't happen while you're there. PTSD isn't something that happens as an event. 
PTSD is something that happens when you're out of that event. So you're back home. You're back with your wife and your kids or your husband. That's the other side of it. Three percent of our patients are now female. Something that's really not focused on at all anywhere in the United States. There's tons of articles about females that have been sexually assaulted. That's had all kinds of concerns just specifically for them. And by and large, they haven't received any kind of treatment for that. Many times they're embarrassed. Many times they have a husband that's also in the service. So they don't want their husband to know because they don't want their husband to do something that's going to land in jail. I've had that conversation several times. But that is another population of, of folks that need treatment as well. The suicide is just complete despair. And to think that we lose 14,000 plus people every single year in the United States, it is absolutely mind blowing to me. So for every soldier that died from 2001 to 2021, 39 die at home by suicide. Those folks died in active war. And it, it just blows my mind when I started digging into the, to these statistics when I first started this organization. I just couldn't get over those numbers. In fact, I checked those numbers. I wrote letters to various folks in, folks in Congress, Department of Defense. They confirmed it. It's, it's true. It's, those are real numbers, as shocking as they are. Traumatic brain injuries. Does anybody know what a traumatic brain injury is? Traumatic brain injuries is an impact injury. So one of my patients, for example, was blown up in a Humvee. His head hit the ceiling of the Humvee. He fell out, part of the door hit him on the head. That's a traumatic brain injury. Those are injuries sometimes, they call them the invisible injury because you don't typically know what they are. They may not be any symptoms of it until much later. And it's one of those things that they've been struggling with because they've had all these crazy ideas going through their head, suicide, departing from where they are, um, just left feeling tired all the time or angry all the time. And, and much of that has been caused by traumatic brain injuries. Treatment, we do psychotherapy. Oh, these are some additional concerns too as well. Alcoholism, addiction to street drugs, prescription drugs, and that part of transitioning back to civilian life. That is very, very difficult for a lot of folks. And, and I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example. One of my patients, when he comes home from work, he would just sit in his garage. He's got three beautiful kids, beautiful wife. He would stay in the garage. He would have dinner in the garage. And he didn't go in the house until after dinner and after the kids were in bed. So I asked him, I said, why are you sitting in the garage all the time? Why don't you go in and see your wife and kids? He said, well, it was Saturday morning. He was in the kitchen with his wife making breakfast. His three-year-old son came in, they have tile floors, and he dropped a toy truck on the ground. He said he immediately spun around and grabbed his son by the shoulders. And he said it scared himself. He was afraid he would hurt one of his kids. Didn't know he had that kind of reaction in himself. So he was terrified to go back in. He was afraid he would hurt somebody if he heard some noise. Um, another one, another gentleman, I was called to a... Um, M vets one afternoon and they said we got a guy that's been a member here for several years he never drinks more than two beers he's never out of order and he's here and he's laying under the pool table and he won't talk and he won't come out so I literally drive over there and some guys were playing pool and when they hit the pool ball it struck the wall that had a metal sign on it he just immediately fell to the floor and crawled under the table so I go out to meet him. I literally sit down and lay down next to him under the table and just tell him that I'm here when he's ready to talk, when he's ready to get out or help him up. I laid there for 20 minutes with him without him saying a word. He finally, finally calmed down, finally got him outside, set him on the tailgate of his truck and talked to him and put him in my service. But those are the kind of things that people don't think about, veterans when they come back, what they're carrying and what they don't realize they're carrying with them. Those type of traumas and traumatic events, you know, when they've heard explosions and they've lost friends in battle, there's so many. I've worked with so many Vietnam veterans and all the way down to the Afghanistan veterans and everything in between. And all of them have such similar stories. It's just the war was different. How it happened was different. 
but they still have the same issues that they're struggling with every day. So treatment is psychotherapy. Every week I give these folks homework. I give them assignments to do. I give them questions to work on, to try to get some insight into themselves, help them better understand why they do the things they do, help them better understand how they want help, why they want help, why they need help. And we go over that every single week. And it helps engage them in the conversation, gives them something to talk about. Because literally there's times I'm on the phone with somebody or video chat and they're just there. And I tell them, you know, this is a two-way street. I can talk all day. That's easy for me. But I need you to talk to and I need you to communicate. So it was really a kind of a plan that made sense to me to give them some work to help slowly start opening themselves up and kind of have a better understanding of who they are and what they're all about and what they really want out of life from now forward. I've heard so many tragic stories, so many things that just are mind blowing to me. Um, every war is different. The enemy is always different, but the war within is the same. And that's what I focus on. Even though we have a different person that we are fighting, we're still fighting that inside. We're still fighting those things that's going through our minds as soldiers that, that hold us back. Um, it's been an amazing journey. Um, the things that keep this going for me is receiving letters and emails. And I received a, a letter one afternoon from a woman that just said, Dear Dr. Moore, I want to let you know that today my husband woke up. He took some notes in the journal you gave him. He took our dog for a walk. He had breakfast with me and the kids. He kissed me on the head. And for the first time ever, he took our kids to school by himself. That's progress. That's the same guy that used to sit in his garage and never come in the house. So seeing that transition over the course of about 18 months, is just amazing to me. So it can happen. The change can happen. And I think them knowing that there's somebody there on their side that they can talk to. I'm not a government official. There's absolutely no cost for them. And we are currently treating about 140 to 150 patients a month. In order for me to get out and do community service like this, I now have two other doctors on board that's now helping with the, with the overflow of patients uh, as they come in, especially with the ladies, if they prefer a female doctor, I have a female on staff now. Some would rather talk to, to a female. Some men don't wanna to talk to a female, they wanna to talk to a man. So in, in the same context, we have all bases covered now. The other segment that we're noticing too, we're noticing that 30 year old range is really getting a huge uptick coming on board now. And some of those guys were in Somalia, they were in Iraq, even Afghanistan, but we're seeing a huge uptick in that, in that particular, particular demographic right now. And we're gonna see even more of that as we go into the future. I think so many of these young recruits, their perspective on life is a lot different than ours. They play video games. It's been part of their lives since they could crawl. I remember in video games for invented. These guys, that's all they've ever had. They've had phones, cell phones in their hands since they could remember. Their idea of war by and large was based on playing video games. They knew how many kills they had on a video game. And they can tell you. But when they went to war and came back, it wasn't pleasant. There was no victory. You don't win prizes. And I, I think that's what's by and large pushing this forward for them to seek help. And the one thing I will say about this youngest generation right now is they're not opposed to help. It's taken a lot of work to get some of our Vietnam veterans to come to me and talk. And I fully understand it. My dad and mom's age group, I fully understand it. Men, men didn't talk about the feelings. Men absorbed everything they had to absorb. They did their jobs, they took care of their families, and they put everything else aside. If they were hurting, no one knew it. The younger generation has been told since they've been very young that it's okay to seek help. And I think that is one really positive thing to come out of that, is that they're okay with asking and talking about it. This gentleman, Adam, was a great one too. Drinking so much, this guy was drinking hard liquor every single day. He was emotionally suffering. He was withdrawn from everybody. 
I've worked with him on and off now for about a year. Um, he just didn't understand, you know, the cultural differences of Afghanistan in our wars. There are people in America. And I'll tell you real quickly, one of the things he told me that's the most devastating thing I think I've heard from one of our soldiers. He was in a group in Afghanistan that went out to small villages and Humvees, and they towed a trailer and they took soccer balls. They took flip flops for the kids. They took candies they had all these things that were donated and brought over to really build a relationship with the locals to say that, you know, we're here to support you and protect you, not harm you. And he said one afternoon, they're out on the regular mission. They pull into this village. All the kids automatically brought out because they see them every week. And he said as, as they were up there, they were handing some things out. They were running out of some of the stuff. So he went back to the trailer to get some more items out. He said when he went back to the trailer and opened the door, he noticed a little girl away from the crowd. And she was just standing there. She, she kept looking back. And he's like, I look back, and there's a guy back here. She takes five more feet and she explodes. Her father had her had her had it, uh, explosives on her body, blew her up, blew the Humvee over. This guy ended up with a traumatic brain injury from it and hearing loss. They lost the soldier. They lost 15 children. It was a total disaster. And for him to wrap his head around it, having four children, he just can't make sense of it. And that is the primary difference in the wars that we've been fighting as opposed to the wars we fought in the past. The soldiers in the past wanted to survive. The soldiers today are martyred if they don't survive. Huge difference. So the enemy is completely different. And I think having those conversations with people that see that and you see little kids coming out, shooting at you, kids that are the size of your own kids, how do, how do you understand that? It's so difficult on that. So we've had a lot of community support, everything from the American Legion to the VFW. We were invited this year to the Pittsburgh Pirates on two different occasions. They have a uh, veteran um, uh, baseball game every year, a couple times a year, and they invited us as the only company in Ohio to come out and talk about our organization in front of the crowd and allowed us to have a booth and have handouts. Um, I tried to get Ohio State, but they won't return my calls. <laughs> and I'm right here. <laughs> the Pittsburgh Pirates did. It was an amazing experience just to be in a major league club like that and get to meet the players and, and be on the field. And the Rotary Clubs have been extremely inviting. I've worked with the Rotary Clubs, both of them that's over in Westerville now. I've worked with the Rotary Clubs down in Florida now. And uh, they've always been very, very supportive and inviting of us. I do have some things. I have some handouts for you guys. If you'd like some, I'll put them on the table back there. Here's some contact information. A little handout I have, if you have a smartphone, you can just scan the code on it and it'll take you right to the website. You can read about us on there, read a little bit about our history. Um, there's different things that you can do to get involved. So you can see all that on there from volunteering and anything else that uh, makes sense to you. Volunteers are always something that's very helpful for us uh, as we get into the community and as we come back to spring here, eventually the weather is going to get better, fingers crossed, and uh, get back out into the community. If uh, any of you live in the Delaware area, the American Legion headquarters for the state is on 36. When you get off of 71 and head toward Delaware, it's about two miles. They're going to be doing a big festival this coming spring in May. Uh, they did one last year for the first time, and this year they're going to make it even bigger. So you're welcome to come out to that. Um, check back on our website. The information will be on there. But it's a good time. They have a lot of veterans there. They have horse rides. They have the police department, sheriff's department. And one other thing, too, if you're a veteran yourself, is anybody here veterans? Okay, so we have a couple of you. I have a vehicle outside that we have recently had wrapped in OD green. It's the original military color. And on the back of the truck, I actually have an area called American Heroes where I'd love to have you sign the back of it. I got a special marker for it, just signifying that, yeah, we do have these folks in the community, our heroes. So I'd love to have you step out when you get a chance and sign that. Um, I appreciate everything. If you have any questions, you're, you're welcome to ask me. I can stay after anything that you might think of. Uh, I'm here. Yes, sir. The suicide statistic is obviously overwhelming. Uh, is 
how do you say that goes way beyond what your organization can deal with? Are, are there other organizations? Is, is the Veterans Administration dealing with this in some fashion? They are. The VA has a suicide hotline that they put together now. Um, and I just had this conversation earlier with one of the gyms. I know there's several gyms in here. And, <laughs> and um, basically the VA, what's going on with the VA is they are drastically understaffed. Their patient population is extremely overwhelming. I have talked to multiple doctors that do exactly what I do. And they tell me they need to see 30 patients a day. <laughs> well, APA format for therapy is 45 minutes. There's no way you could see 30 patients in a day. And I am not here to discredit the VA. I know they're trying to do what they can with the resources they have, but they are drastically overwhelmed, but they have put together a hotline for it. And I know that is man 24 hours a day. I had uh, one, one of my guys I talked to for probably a year about coming to us. Um, he just wasn't quite ready to come to therapy. And he had been waiting 18 months to get into the VA to talk to the doctor there. So he got his appointment and I knew he had his appointment at 10 o'clock. At 10 20, he calls me. And I said, What's going on? I said, I thought you had your VA appointment today. He goes, I did. I said, Well, what happened? He goes, Well, I walked in, I met him, I shook his hand. He wrote me five prescriptions, one of them I'm allergic to, and said, Have a good afternoon. That was the extent of it. And he was back in his car calling me within 20 minutes. Now, I'm not here to bash the VA. I know they're, they're struggling. They don't have enough. They don't have enough clinicians nationwide. Um, not even nearly enough. So I know that that's the tough part. And I've worked in large systems like Ohio State and Ohio Health in the past. I understand when you work with a large system, you know, you're only granted so much. You only have so much leverage. So I fully understand that part of it, but it is, it's really sad. It's sad that they don't have enough people to treat them. Yeah. Do you have a demographic, men and women? Um, right now, about 3% of our patients are female. So currently we're running about 140 patients a month, 140 to 150. And how, and are you paid by veteran benefits or? Oh no, I'm, I'm just, all private? it's all private donations, yeah. So the companies that was on the board earlier, many of those companies have made contributions. I have individual contributions. We do fundraisers. If you ever want to do a fundraiser, I'd be glad to participate in it. Um, it's one of those things, once again, just getting out in the community, letting people know that we're here. That's the toughest part. As a doctor, I used to just get money to show up in the bank. It just showed up. I work, I work my shifts, got my bank card out, money's there. Not anymore. <laughs> I have to find it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm a therapist who first dealt with PTSD coming from the veterans coming back to Vietnam in 1971. I saw my first, my first client. But one thing that I kind of learned from that is it's not the cost. You fall in the sleep in front of the TV and heard a helicopter. And at that point, it's going to cost the floor. With an eye to literally tell the sister in law. Wow. And um, and so it was a real shocker when I tried for some some time, but eventually he came he brought me to the point too that a lot of what he was his survival skill in combat is the very thing that it was. Yeah. When he's back, it was he just don't show emotion. Yeah, shut everything down. You have to come. You do exactly what you have to do on the road. Well. And that was a big lesson for me that what was survival for him, or what he believed was survival, is the exactly the opposite. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't translate into modern society very well. Um, PTSD wasn't even recognized until 1975. 1980 is the first time that they would actually pay disability on it, which was a five-year gap. I actually had a patient uh, in Florida who was a lawyer and was a Vietnam veteran. He filed a claim in 1983. His claim was settled in 2020. That's how long it took. He fought and fought. And this is a gentleman that owns a pretty significant law firm. And he's like, they were just wearing us out. 
and they knew they could wear a sock. You know, just bog them down with, with, with filings and it, it was a mess. Well, he finally received it and he's he was convinced they kept dragging it out because they were hoping he was going to die. He's like, I'm going to live to get that check. I might die the next day, but I'm going to get that check. And he finally did. But that's how long it took. It took 40 years so to get that sort of that. They used to call it shell shock. Yes, yes. Shell shock, nostalgia was another term that they used in World War One. Uh, is the Veterans Memorial, do they offer any resources, or are they in this picture at all in terms um, of help or not help? Or... Yeah, not necessarily. They, well, they do. So they do help. It's not geared towards psychotherapy. It's geared toward medical. Um, it is underneath that umbrella, but not directly, if that makes sense. Sure. And a second unrelated question. Uh, what was your favorite lift? When you My were favorite lift? Yeah. Uh, uh, my favorite, my favorite lift at the time was the deadlift. Uh, my squats were in the low 900s. Uh, my bench press was in like 620s, and my deadlift was in the high 700s. Oh my! Yeah. <laughs> now it's like a hundred, maybe. Crazy. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Difference between GBI and concussion. Um, the difference is the impact on the brain. So a concussion is more surface-based, where traumatic brain injury is deeper. That's that's the big difference of it. It, it hits it more globally on the brain. Um, it does show up on scans. Uh, you can see the difference in the brain from a normal brain to a TBI brain. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a memory of a Bank One executive that I worked with. He had retired from Bank One and he became a consultant and was amazing, very smart, very good at consulting. He did a second retirement and moved to Florida. And about five years into his final retirement, he got bunker mentality. So in the middle of the night, he thought they were being raided, he and his wife. He said, Thank God I didn't have a gun in my house, I would have shot her. So it's, it's very real stuff. So thank you. And we have a raffle. We do. It's 22 in the week. And as saying that, I'm, I'm actually being Nick today. Thank you, Nick. Yes, Nick. Hold the same thing. Yeah. I won't. Okay. Last four, 29, 28. People who just bought it before me. Anyone? Right here. Yeah. I believe. 22. And it was new box. Oh, very good. Thank you. Donate it back. Donate it to you. Oh. Very good. And we'll give you some. There's a 492 in the uh, big pot. We'll give you some kind of stuff for one of these. Yeah. Yeah, if you look a bit there. Last four, 29, 38. And Mr. Gears. Oh, my goodness. How many of that for you? <laughs> Six of clubs. All right, now we have a story. There you go. I would have said I lost a drink next Wednesday night. I would have. I know you did. Yeah. All right, first of the things we think, say, and do. First. Second. Third. And lastly. Very good. Don't forget to turn on your badge and we'll see anybody going to the holiday party next Wednesday. I'm <laughs> 
Florida, do you? No. 